Good morning and welcome to our Sunday School lesson for this week. Uh, we find ourselves in the 15th chapter of Romans. Uh, and this is our final lesson in the book of Romans. Uh, the title of this week's lesson is Reach. Paul winds up this incredibly uh, rich letter. Uh, he is in great detail, breaks down the components of the gospel, shares this rich theology with us. Uh, he begins to draw uh, the, this this letter to a close, but I believe with an intended purpose. And that purpose is for us to understand that as a church, that God has given us a gospel for a reason. And ultimately, that's uh, that we might make him known amongst the nations. Our, our verses pick up in verse 14 of chapter 15, but I want to look at, at uh, verse 6 of chapter 15. He's speaking to the church that you may with one mind and one mouth uh, that's an interesting choice of words, uh, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's closing out a specific section, and that section that we discussed at length last week about dealing with our scruples, and that some people may be weak in the faith, and some may be stronger in the faith, and therefore not having to live up to the expectations of others. Therefore, we are not to... Uh, uh, not, not to... Uh, we, we, we are to accept one another and not to allow d divisions, uh, which would over secondary issues. Uh, but as he ends that section with the statement I just read uh, from Romans chapter 15, verse 6, I'll just read it again, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. Ultimately, that is the purpose of the gospel that has been given to us. And the, the idea behind the one mind and the one mouth is that we have an understanding of the gospel. We need to be on the same page theologically, and he has spent all the previous chapters discussing, uh, A, the gospel, and then B, the unity uh, that it should generate within the church. Now, as he gets to the end of this epistle, I think he makes it clear that now with, with a, a unity and that sound mind in our understanding of the gospel, we are to get to work. And we are to go out into the world to make the gospel of, of Christ known. You know, one of the problems in church is that it's easy to get caught up in the ministries of the church. It's easy to get caught up in discipleship programs with other believers. It's easy to have fellowship with believers and make friends with believers and do things with believers and we can get so caught up in church life with other believers that we actually uh, neglect the very purpose for which the church was created. And in verse six, he makes it very clear what that purpose, uh, what, what, what we are called to do. He says, with one mouth, uh, that is proclaiming the gospel in unity together, uh, we are to make Christ known, hence glorifying God. Uh, I'm reminded of, of a theologian that I shared with you a couple of weeks ago that the church is the only organization ever created for the benefit of its non-members. Oftentimes when we think about church life, we think about it from the perspective of, of what it means to me, what the church can do for me, or how I can benefit from the church, or how blessed by the church I am. And there's nothing wrong necessarily uh, with those things, but the proper fo focus on the church uh, of the church is not to look inward. The proper focus of the church is to see uh, how I'm blessed. Uh, it, it's not to see how I'm blessed, and it's not to see how uh, what it does for me. Al although we are blessed, and if the church is doing things rightly, it will be doing stuff for, stuff for us. But uh, one of the primary things uh, it will be doing for us is helping us to grow in Christ. And we see this in the first uh, in the first section of, of the verse, starting in verse 14. And then as we grow in Christ, the church, church should equip us to serve Christ. You know that if you look in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul makes it very clear what the leadership of the church is to be focusing on. He gives pastors and teachers for the equipping of the church uh, for, for the work of the ministry. Now, that, that's Ephesians ch uh, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, uh, roughly paraphrased, uh, the idea that the church should always be looking outward. And so after he has spent all this time 
speaking about the rich theology of the gospel, uh, then speaking about the unity of the church, there's an expectation. And that's how we take the gospel out into the world. He wants us to, and this is the first point of the lesson, he wants us to fulfill our calling. In verse 14, he says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. In other words, uh, we are able, because we've grown in Christ, we are spiritually mature, we can hold each other accountable, but we can do the right thing in the eyes of God because that's what the gospel does. It leads us to live in a way that is pleasing to God because at the end of the day, we want praise from him. So we will seek ways uh, to, to live, uh, uh, to, to be doing things according to his will uh, within the context of the church. He says in verse 15, nevertheless, brother, and I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because the grace of God is given to me. And why? Uh, because there are some areas uh, that they need to be reminded of, specifically in the areas of unity. Uh, chapters 11, 12, and 13, uh, then 14 and 15 too. He's speaking about the problems uh, the, the church was experiencing with secondary issues. He says that in verse 16. He says that, that I've might be a minister of Jesus Christ of the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, the offer to the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified hope by the Holy Spirit. In other words, just to repeat what I said a few moments ago, as a gospel comes to us, what happens is that it changes the way that we see one another, changes the way that we relate to one another. The result of that is that we are joining Christ. We are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This is the effect that the gospel has on us. Uh, you've heard me say uh, already in, in, in a couple of our Sunday school lessons, and I think it's important for us to consider this truth, that when we are being sanctified, we are being changed. Uh, and the result of being changed is that we begin to live the gospel, and we begin to live out the truths of the gospel. I see Paul basically alluding uh, to, to that in these verses, uh, that he had to come down hard on them, and quite frankly, uh, they needed to be rebuked. Oftentimes, we are, we are afraid uh, of approaching these areas as the, in the Christian life, and we think that people's behavior is off limits in the church. Uh, but if we're not willing to help each other grow, if we're not willing to hold each other accountable, and going back to verse 6, we cannot with one mind and one mouth glorify God because there will be, by, by, by definition, the church will be in disunity. Uh, so Paul's mission, a large part of his mission in writing uh, this rich theology of the gospel is to help them grow in Christ. Uh, so before we can take the gospel to the world, we have to apply the gospel to ourselves. And as I've said and I, I think you've heard me say this in previous lessons, it's not enough simply to believe the gospel. Uh, I believe in Jesus. That's great. Uh, but the question we have to ask, if we really believe in Jesus, what effect is that having, uh, what, what impact is that having on my life? And as we grow in the Lord, it's, it's just my observation. One of the things that we discover is how much we need to grow as we walk closer with God. The, the truth becomes a living reality in our life when we realize how, how far short of the glory of God we really fall. We discover that we have a lot of room to grow, each and every one of us, but it generates this profound sense of humility and it makes us teachable. That's what the gospel does. It makes us teachable in the things of God. Therefore, uh, we, 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 we open ourselves up in the truth we open ourselves up to God and the gospel and the power of the gospel. And the result is the truth doesn't just enter our mind, but it infiltrates every area of our life. Become radically changed. We become a new creation in Christ. And so as we're fulfilling our calling, it begins there. We need to apply the gospel to ourselves. And that's what Paul's been doing. Uh, the gospel is given to save us, it, not just so that we can go to heaven, 
uh, but so that we can become a new creation in Christ and then become, uh, but becoming that new creation in Christ, we can understand that we are called to serve Christ. Uh, one of the, I think, the healthy impacts of the gospel uh, is to help us understand that God is doing this amazing work. I mean, God is saving sinners, and the reality is that God doesn't owe us a thing. Uh, not only does he not owe us anything, but the reality is if God gave us what we deserve, we would find that we were utterly and completely condemned. And yet, despite our sin, despite our rebellion, God comes to us with incredible grace. Um, he gives us mercy, and he loves us to the point where his son died for us on the cross. And then we really begin to understand the depths of our depravity and then in turn begin to understand the richness of his grace. Um, then we realize that if we make Christ known to the world, if we are serving him, the only thing that we can do is to point people to Jesus. So it makes it very clear that is our job. This is our purpose. Uh, going back to verse 6, with one mind and one mouth, we glorify God, and we do that by boasting in Christ, boasting in what he has done, boasting in his achievement and his accomplishment on the cross. L look at what verse 17 says. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus and the things which pertain to God, for I will not dare speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that Jerusalem and around about Elycrium, I, I could say it a while ago, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. In short, what Paul is doing here is making it very clear that anything that was done to bring the to bring God glory that is a product of what Jesus is doing through him. Paul is clear, clearly uh, communicating the message that it's all about Jesus. <laughs> it's all about Christ. Everything is about him. If there's anything that was accomplished uh, through Paul, it was accomplished because Christ was working through him. So he's dependent on Christ. Uh, what is done for the glory of God by Christ. Therefore, the only thing that ultimately both he and the church and then us today can boast in is Christ. What we learn is that our job is to point to Jesus in everything. Our attitude in ministry, whether a teacher or a preacher or whether we're just participating in the ministry, maybe not leading the ministry, our, our job should always be first and foremost to point people to Jesus to boast in him, uh, to brag on God, to brag on what he has done for us, how he left heaven, how he disrobed himself of his glory, how he took on the form of a servant and as a servant was willing to suffer for us. Uh, he, he stood in that place on our behalf. He went to the cross and he experienced the judgment against our sin and he suffered the wrath of God and died that terrible death on a cross not only the physical pain, but the spiritual torment of God's wrath. And he died and he went to the grave because the wages of sin is death. And he did this for us, but despite us. You know, we have to remember, remember ourselves that, that sin, our sin put Jesus on the cross. It wasn't just the people in the crowd that day. It wasn't just the people crying, crucify him. Uh, it's our rebellion. It's our lawlessness. Every time we choose to sin, we are hammering the nails uh, into his hands and we hammer the nails into his feet. And yet when he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We have a difficult time comprehending the depth of our depravity. So there's no room for pride. Because when the gospel comes to us, that's revealed to us. Uh, you know, Paul, amazingly, at the end of his life, uh, at the end of his ministry, he said he was the chief of sinners. He didn't say this at the beginning of his ministry. The longer he walked with God, the more awareness that he had of, of his own sin, of, of the depths of depravity, and therefore uh, he became so aware of the richness of God's grace. 
So he was doing ministry. All he could think about was, I've got to brag on Jesus. Uh, I've, I've got to point people to Jesus. I've got to make Jesus known. Uh, he wasn't inter interested in making himself known. He wasn't interested in bragging on himself. You know, every once in a while, we run across a, a person, uh, one of those people who's always, they always talk about themselves. And it's sad uh, that it reveals, well, what it reveals is a very pro profound sense of immaturity. Um, where we need to grow in this area is to become like John the Baptist. I must decrease so that he may increase. Um, this is the attitude that Paul has. He has decreased uh, in, in, the eye, in his eyes, and he understands it, that outside of Christ, he has nothing. And then if God was to fully give him what he deserves, he would be condemned. So, so, so as the church is fulfilling its calling, uh, being equipped and growing to be and growing uh, to being sanctified uh, by the Holy Spirit, uh, they realize that they have we have a job to do, and that job is to glorify our God, and we brag on Jesus and boast in Him and Him alone. Uh, but we don't just do that for the sake of boasting. Uh, we boast in Him because we want the lost to be saved. We want to seek the lost, and then He says in verse twenty. So I've made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he has not announced, they will see, and those who have not heard shall understand. In other words, the gospel is going to the ends of the world, the ends of the earth. God's promise was just to the Jewish people. Paul feels obligated to the Gentiles to take them the good news, to make Christ known to seek the lost, for they have never heard the gospel. You know, the, in the Bible Belt, especially here in Tennessee, there are a lot of churches where we live. Uh, we, we live in an area, a very small community here in West Tennessee, and there are a lot of churches in this area. There's nothing wrong with that. Praise God for that, uh, that there are a lot of churches in this area. But we often overlook the, the, the fact that there are a lot of people in the world that are yet to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. There are people who have never heard of the, the, the gospel. There are people in the world that are yet to hear the gospel. Uh, Paul was living in a time when the gospel was just beginning to go out into the world. Uh, we are living in, in a time where I believe the opportunities are about to be wrapped up. Uh, I'm, be I'm believing that we're, we're close to the end of the age of the Gentiles. Uh, it, it's going to come to a close, and we're going to see the Lord's return. But until he returns, he makes it very clear that the mission of the church isn't to satisfy ourselves. The mission of the church is to grow so that we can make Christ known. Our job is to take the gospel. In our churches in Tennessee, we, we have to recognize that even though we live in a church culture, uh, there are a lot of people who still don't know the gospel. I just want to encourage us to consider that because people have grown up in the Bible Belt and uh, just because they've grown up here does not mean that they really understand the gospel. There is a lot of inform there, there's a lot of misinformation in our culture. So as a church, we need to make it a priority to begin focusing on our, our, our efforts, as Paul was doing, to look outward. If we're going, if we're growing in Christ, if we're being sanctified in Christ, and we're being equipped then to go out into the culture, our job then is to make Christ known. Even in the Bible belt, that is difficult. That belt is becoming, uh, the buckle of the belt is becoming a little, a little rusty. Uh, I want to consider if there's a lot of people who still really don't, but maybe have a clear understanding of the gospel. And uh, we need not to make the assumption that because they live around the church, they understand the gospel. We need to make it our effort to help them understand, to share the gospel to live the gospel in their presence and glorify uh, to Jesus by making him known. Uh, and finally, we, we can't do that alone, though. Uh, we have to do it as a church. We have, been, uh, we have to be unified, as he says in verse 6, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You, you know, the gospel proclamation isn't just the job of the preacher or the Sunday school teacher. It's the job of the entire church. 
all of us have a part to play. And so I want you to look at what he says in verse 30. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. Now I want you to think about his prayers. He is praying and he is asking the church to join him in his prayers for what? So he can go and make the gospel known to people uh, who have never heard of Christ before. So the church is enlisted to be a part of that. And the first thing that we're called to do is we're, uh, as we're taking the gospel into the community is to spend time in prayer. Then he has a specific uh, prayer request concerning his ministry. That in, in, in verse 31, he says that, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. And why does he say that? Because he wants to bring the gospel to his people. Remember in chapter 9, the first three verses, he says, I tell you the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, for my countrymen, according to the flesh. So God called him to be a minister to the Gentiles. Uh, but he was burdened for his people, and he was going back to his people. He didn't uh, know how things were going to turn out. Although in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit tells him uh, it's not going to go the way that maybe he thinks. He's going to end up in Rome and not Spain, and there ultimately he's going to give his life for the gospel. But as he's given this prayer request, he's saying, pray for my ministry, that it would be fruitful, essentially. Uh, he, he knows that for the ministry to be successful, all hands need to be on deck. Everybody needs to be on board. Everybody needs to be praying, and we need to be praying together. Uh, pause for a minute, and let's think about uh, 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 our prayer services, uh, prayer services of churches in general, uh, not, not just First Baptist Church, but prayer services of churches in, in general. So, so often, prayer services are focused on us. We think that prayer services need to look like the register at the local hospital. Uh, there's nothing wrong with praying for the sick. Uh, but dear friends, the greatest sickness in our culture is sin and separation from God. And if we don't pray for those people who are separated from God because of their sin, uh, they will wind up in hell. There's only one cure for sin sickness, and that's the gospel. Our job is actually to focus on bringing the gospel to the lost, and our prayers should, ref our prayers should reflect that reality. Uh, listen, God has raised up doctors, and if we have a health need, we need to go to the doctor. We can pray for our health needs. I have a doctor who will pray with me about my health needs. There's nothing wrong with that. But we, we need to have a more of a focus on our prayers where, where they belong and making Christ known and glorifying his name, praying that the gospel would go forward in power. I, I want to tell you, I've, I've been ministering in churches for nearly 45 years, uh, and uh, it's challenging to, to get any group of people to consistently pray for the lost. Uh, I don't always do that in my prayers, and I don't say that to my credit. Um, we're more concerned with looking inward uh, because we have gotten in the habit of doing stuff with other believers. Uh, Paul, as he gets to the end of this letter, is directing the church not to focus on themselves, uh, but to put the focus where it belongs, that is, in making Christ known to the world. That's what we're called to do. So uh, let, let's go do likewise. Let's fulfill our calling. Uh, let's brag on Jesus. Amen. Uh, I want to tell you something. There, there's a lot to brag on if we focus on what he's done. There's a lot to share if we go out and seek the lost. There's a lot to tell the lost about how much God loves them. Understanding that we have to partner with one another, and we do so uh, as we do so, we need to be praying for the lost. We need to be focusing our energy, and not just in prayer, but I'm going uh, e evangelizing and then discipling those who come to know Christ in faith. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the church. Remember, the church is the only organization uh, ever created for the benefit of its non-members. 
We are called to be servants. We are called to serve the law, the, the law just like Christ served us uh, by making Jesus known. Uh, let, 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 let's go do that. Let, let's let this richness of this theology that Paul reveals in Romans equip us and motivate us to make him known. Amen. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you for joining me this week. This concludes our study of the book of Romans. Uh, beginning next week, we will be in the book of Proverbs. Hopefully uh, on Sunday and during our time next week before we gather for worship on June the 7th, uh, we will have some instructions on how you can uh, acquire your Sunday school literature for the coming quarter. Of course, it will be available to you at church on that Sunday morning, June the 7th. Uh, it will be available to you the week before that uh, in some manner that you can, you may come by the, the church and, and pick it up in, in a safe and secure manner. Uh, we will continue to provide these Sunday school lessons uh, until we are able to meet without any restrictions that un until the social distancing is a, is, is a memory of may we always be careful, but uh, uh, until we all feel comfortable with going back into our Sunday school classes and being that close to one another again in, uh, in reference to this COVID-19, we'll continue to have these online Sunday school lessons, uh, obviously at, at a different time. Um, but be in prayer, be in prayer for your church, be in prayer for your church leadership, uh, that we, we will do the, the right things in Christ. As we said a few weeks ago, we'll be good citizens and be responsible. Uh, let us pray together, and then I'll see you at 10 o'clock for worship. Uh, Father, thank you so very, very much for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your word, and Lord, for the truth that it provides for us, for the con convicting, converting power of the gospel. Lord, thank you for all those things, and help us to live a life in front of a lost and dying world that points people to Christ. May everything that we do be a boast in you and glorify your name. For it's the name of Christ that we ask this prayer. Amen.